Good morning, everyone. Welcome to another RF Crypto video. We're going to speak a little bit about the market movements. We're then going to move on to how the option markets are behaving going into Friday and into the new year, looking at some longs versus shorts in coin glass. We're also going to speak a little bit about Binance and its relationship with Canadian regulators. Also, how South Korea is going to start verifying private wallets and why this is. Then move on to how Polygon patched an exploit that put about 9 billion Matic coins at risk. There are airdrops of coins that are not backed by anything when we're going to speak a bit about the dangers of that. Also, how um, the hash rate in Bitcoin is increasing due to new entrants. There's an increasing trend of more businesses, including restaurants, starting to accept uh, crypto as payments. We're going to speak a bit about that. And finally, how Blockbuster, you might not have heard of it, is actually not dead. The crypto markets today are down again by 2.2%. It now stands at 2.2 trillion as market cap. Yesterday it had decreased by almost 3% and today it uh, decreased by another 2.5%. A few days ago the market was at 2.5 trillion, around 2.5 trillion, and now it's decreased to 2.2 trillion. This is just because Bitcoin investors are protecting themselves against even lower prices ahead of New Year's. The markets are behavioral. They follow whatever the people expect. People expect the prices of cryptocurrencies to go down going into the new year because now the Santa rally is over. So naturally it pumped, now it can only go down. So what are the people doing? They're purchasing uh, put options, which means that they're betting that the price of Bitcoin is gonna go down. So options are basically uh, financial derivatives that gives the owner the right but not the obligation to buy or sell an asset. If you have a call option, it gives you the right to buy. And if you have a put option, it gives you the right to sell. So if you have a call option, you are bullish. You expect the price to go up. And you have a, if you have a put option, you're bearish and you expect the price to drop. In this case, Tuesday and Wednesday saw upward of a combined almost $1.8 billion in options volume on crypto exchanges tracked by Glassnode. Uh, and these are mostly put options which means that $1.6 billion have gone into derivatives, which are the options, but it's an expectation that the price is gonna go down. And also a very important thing is that $6 billion worth of options are going to expire on Friday. A total of 129,800 options contracts are set to expire. Most of these options are calls, which means that these options that are going to expire on Friday are have the expectations that the prices are gonna go up, but we've seen the prices going down and if they expire and they're worthless, because if they were taken out at the time when Bitcoin was at 48,000 or 50,000, and now the price of Bitcoin you can see here is 46,851, this, this means that they're not making a profit. These call option holders are not making a profit. So they'll just let the options expire. And if they let the options expire, it puts downward pressure on the price. That combined with these new almost $1.8 billion in new put options are going to in my opinion, put downward pressure on the price of Bitcoin. So we'll just have to see how the price acts until tomorrow. And also crypto research funds noted that the max point, max pain point for Bitcoin is 48,000. And also data suggests that Bitcoin tends to move towards this 48,000 or max pain point in a lead up to expiration and sees a strong directional move in days after the settlement. Max pain is 48,000. The price is currently less than 47,000. This is not a good sign for all these call option holders and it's more than likely that they're going to let the options expire and put even more pressure on the price of Bitcoin. So we'll just have to see from now until the time that the options expire how Bitcoin moves. As you know, it could go up or it could just stay the same. If it goes above the 48,000, it could mean a good sign for the markets, but if it stays below, then we'll, we'll see these options expiring worth nothing. And if we look at some data relating to longs and shorts in the markets, you can see that in the last hour, for example, there are more shorts than longs. People are bearish. People think, are expecting that going into the new year, the price of Bitcoin is going to go down. Overwhelmingly, they're bearish. If you look at the five minute mark, super bearish. I mean, this is indicative that the market sentiment is currently negative relating to Bitcoin and the crypto market in general. As you can see, this can change within an hour. In one hour, it was almost the same, but obviously a little bit leaning more towards bearish. But in the last five minutes, after 55 minutes, 
it became super bearish all of a sudden. So the markets are usually like this, they usually act like this, and we'll have to monitor this going into tomorrow. Moving on to some news, Binance is to continue operating in Ontario after cooperating with Canadian regulators. So in June, Binance told its users it will be pulling out of Canada's most populous province following uh, actions by the Ontario Securities Commission against other crypto exchanges accusing them of non-compliance with regulators. So between June and December, I believe that Binance has been in talks with the Canadian regulators and they have come to consensus. And as a result of ongoing and positive cooperation with Canadian regulators, Binance in Canada has been successful in taking its first steps on the regulatory path by registering in Canada as a money services business with Fintrack. It's a good thing. Regulation is a good thing. It removes the uncertainties of whether a company can operate in a country or not. And now the fact that it's going to be registered as a money services business means that Binance is staying in Canada in the long term. And they even might uh, create a branch or a headquarters in Canada. I believe this is a big relief for um, Canadian customers because they were told in June that they might they should close their accounts by December 31st and they don't have to anymore. Although I feel sorry for those that have already closed their accounts, but uh, it's damage control, I believe. On other news, South Korean crypto exchanges are to follow Coin1 in verifying private wallets. Major South Korean crypto exchanges, including the major ones, Upbit, Bitthumb, and Corbit, will follow Coin1, which is another exchange, uh, in banning transfer to non-verified wallets. They would reject any deposits from any private wallets that are not verified starting from January 24 in order to reduce money laundering. This makes sense, right? Because if something is not verified, you can just transfer freely in order to avoid reporting these things to your tax authorities. And although proponents of cryptocurrency do not like regulation and they say, you know, these guys are stealing from us, the government is stealing from us, this isn't really the case because Without regulation, it's anarchy. We need some rules established in order for the system to work and in order to remove this volatility from the market that wrecks a lot of people. I mean, if half a dozen people are controlling the markets, they manipulate the markets so that they can make unlimited profits and you and I, the retail investors that trade every day, get this advantage. So regulation is going to help us. All Korean exchanges are expected to implement similar or identical measures as Coin1 on or before uh, March 25th and they set the deadline for exchanges to track coin transactions on and off their platform accurately and this comes at a time when the country has grappled with global uh, financial regulation compliance issues relating to non-fungible tokens financial regulators flip-flopped on their policy direction regarding NFTs until the latest statement by the FSC stated on November 24 that it would explore its options to regulate and tax NFTs. Um, South Korea has been very, very popular with cryptos, with a lot of crypto exchanges being founded there and a lot of activities going on in terms of NFTs and the metaverse. It was a free-for-all because it wasn't regulated. Anyone could register. It, it became too big. Uh, too much, they yielded too much power. And now with regulation coming in, even though it's slowly, it's going to help stabilize this industry and make it one where everyone can benefit from. Yesterday, Polygon patched an exploit that put 9 billion Matic at risk, which equates to around $20 billion. There was a hacker who helped Polygon avert a multi-billion dollar disaster in December, and he won a $2.2 million reward for this. This is actually a good thing. People think this is a bad thing. It's a good thing. They're actively going out to their community and saying, if you can find bugs in our systems, please tell us and we'll reward you. This is good because uh, it gives Polygon time to fix those bugs before they can actually affect its users. This is an example of it. They managed to fix this bug. This was a critical bug in Polygon's smart contract platform and it held more than $20 billion worth of goods. Although they weren't so fast as to uh, stamp out the bug in time because Hackers still managed to get around $1.4 million worth of Matic tokens out of the uh, Polygon network. This amount seems like a lot. It's nothing compared to $20.2 billion that were at risk. So it's a good gas DAO token struggles to maintain momentum after airdrop. These airdrops are coming in right, left and center, if that's a correct expression. And they promise users, we're going to give you these uh, amounts of tokens if you stake this amount of Ethereum, this amount of this and this amount of that. A lot of these tokens, they have no utility. For example, this one, with no product, no plans for a product and no utility, the freshly minted gas tokens run maybe even more short-lived. So this was a very, very hyped airdrop. A lot of people went into it. And now they're getting these tokens and they see their, the prices of gas 
going down and down and down. So if a product has no utility, no plans, and no product, then it's already a red flag. Even though airdrops give you token for free, they're getting a benefit out of it more than you because with the staked tokens that you stake in their platform, they take those tokens and they stake it as well and get rewards for it. And they don't lose anything by giving you th these tokens like gas. As Dijen Spark said, he mentioned what is gas DAO to be a heartbeat and voice of the Ethereum network's active users through on and off chain governance. Dijen Sparkson is right. That's a lot of words for valueless governance and tokens. There has to be a lot of thought behind investing in any airdrops, staking in any airdrops, especially in a time of volatility like this where prices are going down. You might gain some tokens like gas, but if the value goes down, you may even be at a loss because the amount of gas tokens that you sell and the amount you get for it will actually be less than the loss you got from the price movements of the tokens that you stake to actually get that gas. So newly minted Bitcoin miner gem mining reaches a hash rate of 1.25 exahashes per second. This now accounts for 1% of the Bitcoin network's total. So this company, Gem Mining, was founded by a former South Carolina governor, John Warren, and he raised $200 million in order in institutional capital from big VC funds in order to found this um, mining company. They have 13, over 13,000 machines running and mining 6.5 Bitcoins a day, which is over $300,000 a day. It had revenues of $7.8 million in November. A very, very profitable business so far. And a further 19,000 machines are expected to be online by the end of 2022, which will see the hash rate capacity maybe more than doubling. And it's a trend we see that a lot of new miners are coming on board, which means that the hash rate will increase. And if the hash rate increases, it puts stability to the network. If there's stability in the network, the Bitcoin network becomes more and more reliable. It becomes faster. It becomes safer. And a Florida restaurant called Crypto Street Restaurants is now the latest crypto themed restaurant in the United States. It created menu items such as Dodge Dog, Crypto Cuban, DeFi Caesar Salad, Shiba Shrimp Cocktail, and Bitcoin Anna Split. And it accepts payments in Bitcoin and in all cryptocurrencies, including every single meme coin. You can make payments in fiat, of course, but you can also make payments in cryptocurrencies. The owner accepts crypto payments via merchant's account or peer-to-peer -peer directly to his wallet. And it's an increasing trend where a lot of businesses are popping up in accepting crypto as payments. And now we're seeing crypto themed businesses obviously accepting crypto payments. And I think it's great. I think it's a move uh, in the right direction and it's giving utility to tokens that didn't have previously have any utility, including Dosh and Shiba, which are now seen as uh, methods of payments. Finally, I want to speak about Blockbuster Video. Most of you probably don't even know what Blockbuster is, but it was a company that used to rent out movies. And it was very, very popular, one of the most popular in the world. And with the advent of streaming services like Netflix and Amazon Prime Video, the company almost went bankrupt and now it only operates one store. And a new decentralized autonomous organization has formed with the goal of buying the Blockbuster brand from Dish Network and turning it into a film and streaming studio. They want to raise $5 million through a Blockbuster DAO NFT minting event, and each NFT will be valued at 0.13 ETH. They plan to turn Blockbuster into a decentralized film streaming studio. A decentralized film streaming studio gives all the decisions to the people that invest in the film itself. So if a film requires $5 million or $10 million in budget, it raises funds from users through tokens, and these token holders have an active decision on how the film will progress. It's an interesting concept because now the movie making uh, decisions aren't concentrated with a few people like the producers and the big film companies like Warner Brothers and Sony Pictures, but now it sits with you and I, the average consumer. And it's gonna be interesting, decentralized film, where will it go forward, decentralized music, decentralized theater, and since a lot of this is going into the metaverse, it's also going to be interesting to see how decentralized music, decentralized theater, decentralized entertainment is in general, how it's going to integrate with the metaverse and the evolution is going to be um, something we've never seen before. And with that, we come to the end of the video. Thank you for watching. If you enjoyed the video, please hit the like button and please hit the subscribe button, the notification bell as well, so you're... Uh, notified when we release a new video and we'll see you for the next one. Thank you and cheers.